Okay, um, I'm David. Um, I actually work for Red Hat in the desktop group, doing sort of GNOME things. Um, as part of that, I do a fair bit of packaging, um, and I have my own little hobby projects as well. So I'm going to talk like through way of one of my hobby projects, which is EasyTag, um, about how you might go about building a GNOME application for Windows, um, specifically cross-compiling from Linux using MingW, um, because that's what I've done, as well as many other people before me. So building on Linux is kind of easy. I mean, even using all the tools, it's pretty easy because you're probably pretty used to the general steps of a, a sort of configure, make, make, install process. Um, this does actually miss out quite a bit of complexity. Um, obviously, AutoTools does loads of stuff that you don't necessarily need. Um, but um, that's probably to most packages and people who would build software what they're familiar with. You get some complexities when it comes to the installation part of the process. Um, so if you have something like G-setting schemas, or you know you install a desktop file and you need to update the desktop cache. You install some icons, maybe you need to update the icon cache. These sorts of things. Um, it's not generally such a problem if you have packaging, because a, a packager or, or a package system will have figured this out for you and know that if you install a desktop file into a particular location, that the cache needs to be updated, that sort of thing. It's generally pretty easy to get your package for an application created or to like build your application on a distribution that already exists, probably because you'll be using dependencies that are already packaged. So depending on how complicated your application is, this part of the process maybe isn't that difficult. Um, it's probably a process that you're familiar with because maybe you're already a Linux developer um, or you've already done some, some GNOME apps. So you know people have already trodden that path before you. The problem comes when you want to get your application updated more frequently, you know, you want to work on a release cycle that isn't the LTS release cycle of major distributions or something like that. Obviously, on the, in the Linux world, we're going to potentially have Flatpak that makes this a lot easier for us in the future for application developers, but not there quite yet. And um, that's something that maybe it would be good to have on Windows, but also isn't there on Windows yet. Problem if you actually want to build on Windows, for me at least, is that I don't have a Windows license. I could buy one. I mean, they're not so expensive, but I don't know. I don't have one. I also don't have a Visual Studio license. So if I wanted to develop on Windows, I'd, I'd probably have to use a free compiler on Windows. I don't know much about that because I don't have a Windows license. And I'm sure that there are some people who would be able to tell me about that. Maybe you can even get Visual Studio for Windows now that, with a free license in the sense that you can download it. It's free as in beer. Um, I think there are some limitations if you go that down that route. Um, but basically, a lot of it is kind of inertia that you have to learn something new and do something different than what you're used to. If you're already developing on Linux and you're pretty happy with that, then probably going to Windows to develop on Windows is going to feel a bit alien to you, much like it would probably to go onto macOS for something like that. So not my cup of tea, should we say. Um, the other thing is that you don't have a platform to build on if you're used to developing on a platform on Linux. If you're developing on Linux, you're probably already using a toolkit like GTK or, or you know, like something like GStreamer for all of your multimedia stuff. On Windows, all of those things are different. So if you want to continue using the same platform, you have to bring the platform with you. Um, to be frank, that's a pain in the ass. Um, building all of those things that make up the, the platform you're using isn't really very fun. Um, you can use tools like jhbuild, but have fun with that on Windows, I guess. Um, wouldn't it be great if someone had already done this for you? Um, and it kind of turns out they have, so I'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing is that like a lot of projects use auto tools. Auto tools on Windows um, is even slower than on Linux um, because it like forks all the time and, and does loads of horrible stuff. So yeah, you're going to run into problems with that as well if you actually do this on Windows. It's not great on Linux either. But. Um, so like one possible solution, not necessarily saying it's the best one, but it's the one that works for me, is to cross compile your applications from Linux um, ta and targeting Windows. Um, it's actually pretty simple to do. AutoTools is pretty good at handling compilation for you, uh, as well as like most of the other build systems like CMake and stuff. 
the cross compilation stuff there works okay. Um, and there are helpers for you as well. Um, the nice thing is you get to develop as you normally would um, on your Linux host system. Um, and you just have a build system that just spits out what you want at the end. Uh, you still kind of have this problem where even if you have a compiler um, um, and tool chain that will actually spit out Windows binaries, you still need to build all of your platform. Um, but it turns out that other people have wanted to do this as well. So I think that in Fedora, at least, it was uh, the Spice guys, the people who worked on like Vert Viewer and Vert Manager. They wanted to have these tools available on Windows as well. And so the easiest way for them to do that and keep their existing workflow was to cross-compile from Linux. Mingw, like the, the the minimal GNU for Windows, which is basically a, a tool chain and various development headers and, and things that you need to build applications, that's, that's existed for a fair time, but it's quite usable now. Um, you can target 64-bit and 32-bit Windows platforms with it. Um, it works pretty well. Um, and that was already packaged for Fedora, but what wasn't packaged was all the stuff in between, like the GTK and the Pango and the Cairo and all of these other things that, you know, as a regular developer, you don't really want to have to build yourself. But since Fedora 17, which is ooh, a few years ago now, um, those things are packaged and regularly updated on the, on the GNOME release cycle. They're maybe not quite as up-to-date as what's in, um, you know, like the, the latest GNOME versions, but they're de definitely up-to-date enough to make any regular GNOME application, um, say from the last cycle, compile pretty easily. Um, you'll find that there are some exotic packages that are missing. So for easy, in the easy tag case, it depends on some really, really old ID3 libraries like ID3 lib and uh, lib ID3 tag. Those weren't available. So most of my support for these sort of things is optional. So I could, I could at least build uh, my application without those. Um, the problem is that then you have to actually do some packaging yourself in order to get those packages available on Fedora. You can install all of the other packages that are available on Fedora, all the MingW ones, pretty easily. If you just do like a DNF search, MingW32 or 64, if you're building for 64 Windows, you'll come up with a lot of these packages, so you can install those without much difficulty. But you'll, you'll definitely find some that are missing. If you don't want to actually package those yourself, you can ask on the Fedora MingW mailing list. I'll give a link at the end. Well, there's a the link at the bottom of the slide there actually will take you to an information page about that. Um, I did it myself and got these packages into Fedora so that other people could use them as well. And so that if I wanted a, um, someone to come along and actually help with a Windows port, they could just build it with a few simple commands. But you don't have to do that if you don't want to. You can either make the packages yourself or you can do that as part of your own build system. Another nice thing that Fedora has is it has a configure helper. Um, that's just so that when you build um, um, for a different target than your host system, you actually need to tell auto tools, yeah, you need to use this compiler um, and this other this, the, this tool chain and all of these other things. Um, that's a bit laborious to do on the command line if you're doing it frequently for sort of test and rebuild cycles. So the Fedora guys, as part of their MingW tool chain, they ship just a configure helper that sets all of these variables for you um, because they have a particular way that they put all of these files into a prefix. So um, you can just call mingw32-configure and as long as you have a configure script there that you've generated with autogen or something, it will just pass all of the right arguments along on the command line so that, that all just works. Then the next problem is that, so you've built your application because you've, you know it's a GTK application, it's not too complicated. Um, and in easy tags case, that, that is mostly true. Um, but then what do you do with it? Um, I mean, on Linux, you'd expect there to be some kind of package. So you know, you'd go into each distribution and you make sure that these packages were there. Um, and maybe you'd have a PPA if you wanted to target Ubuntu or something. But on Windows, there isn't really any of that kind of distribution model yet. You can There's nowadays like a, a, a store that you can use but then you have to be a Microsoft, have a Microsoft developer account and various other bits. If you're just a free software developer and you want to get your pet application on Windows, then the easiest way is to create an installer, um, which is what a lot of other people do and have done for a while. Um, it's not really a great experience, but there is a free installer available, uh, which is Ensys, which came out of Nullsoft, which are the people who came up with Winamp. Um, it's a pretty horrible scripting language, but then if you ever use like old school installers, then 
they're all pretty horrible, really. They're all sort of horrible and custom and different. So maybe it's more horrible than the rest, but there is actually another tool that can help you with this. Um, again, the Fedora Spice guys, I think, they came up with this. Um, it's a tool called Ensys Wrapper. Basically, if your project um, is just a regular water tools project and links with things in the expected way, it will go through your uh, binary at the end and say, okay, I can see you link to all these DLLs and it can make sure that all of those DLLs get included in the installer so that when you actually install this on a Windows system, you know, everything actually works, at least in some minimal way. It won't give you a pretty install script. It will give you something that, in my opinion, you actually have to modify. So um, it's good for testing and for sort of quickly generating an installer that you can, you know, just help someone, you know, give someone Windows to get them to test it. But for your regular release builds, you'll want to do something different. In an easy tag, what we actually do is um, we did customize the installer. Um, and then you can just have that as like a .in file in your auto tools build system and like substitute things in like the version and stuff like that. Make sure it uses all the bits you expect. You'll also need some small tweaks for running on Windows. Um, so glib and gtk and, and most other bits of the GNOME stack actually work pretty well on Windows without modification. Um, obviously, it very much depends on what you're doing. If you're doing something really platform specific, like you're looking at desktop files, you know, like you want the list of installed applications and things like that, those are going to work very differently on Windows. Um, some of those things won't work at all. So there are things like G mount and G volume and these these sort of concepts in GIO um, about like the drives that you would have on Windows, like the C drive and, and your DVD drive and things like that. Those work very minimally um, and often slightly differently on Windows than they would on a Linux or Unix system. So you're going to run into some portability problems there depending on what your application does. If it just opens files, you probably won't have much of an issue. But if you want it to work properly with, say, GVFS, yeah, maybe you're going to run into some problems there. Um, specifically in the case of building your application, you're going to want to do a few other custom things for Windows. You're going to want to make sure that your icons are part of the application binary because on Windows, you don't have a separate icon file that the desktop file references. It's all built, built into or executable. So you need to handle that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there is an example inside EasyTag if you want to look. It's hosted on git.gnome.org. Um, but basically, it's just a manifest that you say, take this uh, binary, um, this icon, and embed it into the binary. And there's a tool called WindRes, which is the Windows resource compiler, I think. And that basically just tacks that on as part of the end of the binary or the start of the binary, and then it just works. So again, that's pretty straightforward. Um, you also probably have to worry about your application being relocatable. On Linux, you don't generally do this. You have a well-defined prefix that you set at configure or install time. Um, and then when you install, everything works because you can hard code all those paths. On Windows, you can't do that because you might be installing onto the C drive. You might be installing into a user's home directory, which isn't called a home directory. It's called something else. Um, you might be installing somewhere else. You might just be copying the binary around. So you need to make sure the application is relocatable. Glib has... Uh, not really got, got support for this, but actually with things like G-Resource, you don't really need to worry too much anymore because you can build most of these things into your binary. It's just stuff like locales that you need to search for on disk and things like that. Um, it's a bit ugly, but like Pigeon and GIMP and all of these things that have been on Windows for a long time, they do have a little bit of support for this. So you can look at what they've done. I stripped most of that out with EasyTag and it only does a very, very small amount of stuff. I think mostly it's just the locale handling. Um, you can sign the installer because otherwise in modern versions of Windows, if it's not signed, then when you run it, you get a pop-up, I think, that says, oh, I can't verify the publisher of this file. You get a similar thing on macOS as well. Um, I don't bother signing my installer because I'd have to get a Windows developer account. Um, but I think as long as you have a certificate that has a, um, that is, has a verifiable trust chain in that the, um, the certificate is part of the root that's installed on, on Windows, I think that will work. I don't know whether you have to get Microsoft to actually sign the binary. I don't think so. Um, and there are some free software tools that are available to actually do this signing. Um, I think they've even hosted on GNOME.org. I think Toff might have written some of them or will be involved with some of them. So they're pretty cool. Um, if you just have a regular GNOME application, then you're also going to run into some more problems on Windows. If you have documentation, 
Yelp doesn't work on Windows. Um, I don't think you can actually cross-compile WebKit GTK to work on Windows, although maybe someone will correct me on that point. But then you run into other problems, like Yelp being very specifically built for a Linux system. It expects to have the help files and should stalled in user share help or something like that. That's not going to work the same. You can probably maybe set XCG days to the IRs to get around this, but it does things like try to look at the desktop file of the application that launched it and things like that. It needs some work if we want Yelp to work on Windows. So currently I bundle the uh, generated HTML files with my installer. Um, and that's good enough for the moment, but not really um, good for in the future. Um, file names are handled differently on Windows. So on Linux, you, it's just a byte string. Um, and then you generally convert that byte string to UTF-8 when you want to display it. Modulo some problems that you get when you can't convert from the byte string of, of which you have no idea what the encoding is into UTF-8. Um, but on Windows, glib takes uh, UTF-8 as the glib file name encoding. Um, so you can just display that directly. You run into some problems if the libraries that you're using actually don't support um, things other than the, the system code page because you have to worry about like the system code pages which was, which is what FAT uses versus like the sort of extensions which will use Unicode and, and actually work. Um, that's horrible and you can spend many, many days worrying about your file name handling, especially if you have an old project that wasn't really built for this and that doesn't really work properly with converting file names for display. So if you have a modern system and uh, you know in your project and you use gfile everywhere and you convert properly for display, this isn't really a problem. It just depends on how much legacy you've got, really. You run into some problems with things that in glib and gtk that aren't really feature complete. So you like this G monitor, uh, the G drive and things like that, that I mentioned earlier. I don't know things like about G file monitors on Windows. I don't know how well that works. But I mean, if you're using something that isn't just a sort of simple app, you might run into some problems. Um, debugging on Windows if you're compiling from MingW is a little bit painful because you can't use the Microsoft tools to do the debugging. You have to use, I think, GDB. Um, on Linux, it's not so bad because if you, if you if you build a Windows application for Linux, you can run it under Wine. You can use Wine Debug. It's not a very nice tool compared to like the regular GDB that you're used to, but it does work. Um, but on the other, on the whole, the process to do the debugging is a little bit difficult, especially if you don't have regular access to a Windows system. So like, I build all of this stuff, and because I don't have a Windows license, I have to like go around to friends and test it. It's a bit of a pain. Um, and of course, with that, it means that you're building on a different system than you're actually running on. So actually doing that testing is kind of time consuming. So if you only do this occasionally, you just kind of have to hope that you don't break something in between because then testing that and fixing it takes a long time. So it's not ideal. Um, but there are some really nice things that um, since we've had uh, really good CSS theming in GTK, um, applications now look identical um, on all platforms. So whether it's Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, you're using Eduata, it's going to look the same. Um, there are a few differences with regards to title bars, but basically the, it is the case. Um, the reason I built EasyTag for Windows was because lots and lots of users actually wanted this. It used to be built for Windows a very long time ago, but with like this horrible collection of custom build scripts on top of the existing AutoTools build system. So... Um, at least that is now fixed, and it's using exactly the same build system for both, just with some extra targets for the installer and things like that. Um, if you have something that's maybe very GNOME-specific or very Linux-specific, probably your application doesn't really need to be built for Windows. Maybe you won't get much, many more users. Um, but I already had an existing user base, so it made sense for me. Um, and most of the support for Windows and various GNOME libraries actually works pretty well. Um, so you'll probably be quite surprised at how much stuff just works. Um, this is a screenshot of EasyTag running on Windows in German. So like even the translations work and everything. This is actually, this is actually using um, GTK2, not GTK3. So now it uses GTK3 throughout. And actually looks even nicer, but I haven't got a recent screenshot of that. Um, but it really works. Um, this is a link. Um, the bottom link is actually a link to an, 
some instructions so that you can build this um, for Windows yourself if you want to. Basically, it involves installing a load of packages um, and being inside the easy tag sources and then configuring and building. Um, but that's all you need to do. You can now build this completely from your Linux system without really very much difficulty. Um, the Fedora guys, they have a specific page on packaging stuff. Um, it's also got a lot of general information that's kind of handy about building Linux applications from uh, Windows applications from Linux. So I kind of recommend that if you want sort of some idea about what's possible and some of the tricks that you might have to do. Um, but other than that, that is the end and uh, look forward to questions. Less of a question, more of a comment. Um, Microsoft on their website allows you to download virtual machine images for, mm -hmm. it's in theory for testing Internet Explorer versions, but you can get like all kinds of window versions as well. And it's a VM image pre-installed ready to go and it lasts for 90 days. So that's probably pretty close to what you want. Yes, that sounds very useful. Um, I had no idea about this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, regarding the installation, uh, so you mentioned um, um, NSIS. Uh, MacConry worked on uh, MSI tools, uh, which generates for you some native Windows installer. Uh, so basically, you feed it uh, an XML file, um, and yeah, MS MSI tool can handle like some kind of dependencies. You know, you can say, okay, I depend on glib and stuff, and then it will be able to to get the XML file corresponding to glib and then it puts everything in your application, you get an, uh, an installation for free. Uh, so it can be something interesting to look at instead of um, an SIS. Cool, thanks. Have you tried the Clang front end to MSVC? No, I haven't. <laughs> something I should look into, I guess. So um, about Visual Studio, um, there's a version called Visual Studio Community, which is free for open source use. Uh, after 30 days, you'll need to uh, log in with your MSGN account. But that's a free account. So if you want to use that, you can use that too. Cool. So I can develop on Windows if I have a Windows license <laughs> or, or use a VM. So why doesn't run Visual Studio? But if you are crazy, you can get the, just the compilers to run under Wine. So you, and they're actually free downloads, so you can get them. So if you're really, really crazy, you can use Visual Studio <laughs> on Linux to develop these things. I, I, I don't know if I'm that crazy, but it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> so uh, two questions. A, is that still the screenshot I sent you? Yes, it is. Okay. So if, if you want to send me, this is actually... Yeah, uh, I'll send you a new one. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Uh, second, isn't the, the relocation problem, isn't that something that we now have on Linux as well? At least I know there's a problem with Snappy regarding that. Um, yeah. I don't know about Flatpak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, not unique to Windows nowadays. Okay, any other questions? Okay, that's all then. Thanks very much. Thank you.